Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance is apparently in hot water. Trump's VP pick tried to distance himself from Project 2025, a right-wing blueprint for the next Republican administration. But his previous remarks about it might make that difficult. Take a look. You asked about Project 2025, and I want to be clear here uh, that t Trump explicitly has said his own transition team runs the Trump transition and will run the Trump administration. Again, you have a whole host of organizations, some of which have good ideas, some of which have bad ideas, and some of which have both. And I'm sure the Trump administration will talk to a lot of people as it's crafting an agenda. Most Americans couldn't care less about Project 2025. Uh, I reviewed a lot of it. There's some good ideas in there, Rob. Most Americans couldn't care less about Project 2025. And if his words weren't enough, this latest revelation has made it almost impossible to put distance between him and Project 2025. It turns out Vance wrote the foreword for a forthcoming book written by Project 2025's architect, Kevin Roberts. According to the book's Amazon page, in the foreword of the book titled Dawn's Early Light, Taking Back Washington to Save America, Vance writes, Never before has a figure with Robert's depth and stature within the American right tried to articulate a genuinely new future for conservatism. We are now all realizing that it's time to circle the wagons and load the muskets in the fights that lay ahead. These ideas are an essential weapon, J.D. Vance. So in a time of unity and a time of an attempted assassination, we just can't escape the violent rhetoric, Amber. It's like all we've got. Even talking about violence, we're like, we've got to fight violence. Uh, it's just in our vocabulary. It's in our blood as Americans. I don't know what's going on with that. But um, the Project 2025 stuff, obviously very central right now. J.D. Vance seems to be in, entrenched in it quite a bit. The Trump campaign has a task before themselves if they decide that they're going to stay the course and keep their distance from Project 2025. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing your take is that a lot of people are friends on the right and that it's a, a coincidence that Vance and Roberts are friends here and that he wrote the foreword. I mean, actually, yes. <laughs> I think when people talk about this like vast right wing conspiracy in Washington, D.C., it's neither as vast nor as right wing as they try to make it out to be. And the reality is there are not a lot of conservatives in this town. And so we do tend to be friends with each other. Um, I don't think this is a secret or a surprise. I mean, even if you just look at the forewords that Tucker Carlson has written for any number of conservative books that have come out in the past couple of years, um, what people also don't realize is that these forewords are usually done even before the book is finished or before the person reads the manuscript. It's more of just a favor to a friend than it is anything else. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I genuinely don't understand. I know we talked about this in another segment, all of the hand wringing about Project 2025. It's no different to me than any left wing policy platform at a think tank of which there are many in DC, whether it's the Center for American Progress or the, the Brookings Institution. Um, this, is, this is precisely the same thing. They, this is what they are tasked to do. This is what donors give them money for, is to come up with policy prescriptions so that if somebody who's ostensibly on their side gets into the White House, they have some kind of roadmap that hopefully they'll take up and use when they get into office. But of course, there's no guarantee of that. Any administration is going to have their own transition team that may or may not come from those think tanks. They're going to have people who are creating policy who may or may not have connections with those think tanks. And there is always a level of independence there. They're not required or mandated to take Project 2025, pick it up and put it in the White House and say, this is what we're doing. Um, and even so, there's a lot in Project 2025 that there is to like. I think one of the few things that has been harped on is reforms to Social Security and Medicaid in order to balance the budget. J.D. Vance has been very clear that he does not want any cuts to these programs. They were programs that were hugely helpful to his family when he was growing up. He's also advocating for making birth free so that women who have children do not have to pay these exorbitant hospital fees just for having a baby in a safe environment. He has talked about the fact that he wants to increase the child tax credit, which amazingly has actually sparked uh, 
disapproval from members of Kamala Harris's campaign. Uh, we have Amar Musa, who is the director of rapid response for Kamala Harris, saying that J.D. Vance's attacks on childless Americans are vile. He called for higher taxes on those without children. Well, I hate to break it to Amar Musa, but we already have benefits for people who have children in the tax code. Again, they're called child tax credits, and pretty much everyone universally agrees that it's a good idea to incentivize people to have families. Meanwhile, Ann Applebaum admitted that the only reason that she and her friends are worried about Project 2025 is because of the reforms to Schedule F, which would make it easier to get rid of civil servants who are behaving in a political manner in their positions where they're supposed to be carrying out the agenda of the executive. So all of this is, to me, just an attempt at fear-mongering because they know that Trump is winning on the issues. So they're trying to create this fake issue to have people basically looking at a shiny toy instead of paying attention to what the two candidates themselves are saying. Yeah, I don't think we can say Trump is winning on the issues. Um, J.D. Vance is someone who endorsed a six-week abortion ban in his home state. He identifies as someone who's 100% pro-life. He said things like end abortion. And so as a woman in a country where abortion bans are not popular at the national level, I think about this as just like weird fringe, almost anti-women type rhetoric. I think that J.D. Vance's stances on a lot of women's issues is what earned Tim Waltz calling him weird. And a lot of people who have these beliefs about abortion and about childless women weird. It's one thing to incentivize pregnancy to say we want to make the conditions economically good so that money is never a barrier for any woman or family to make the choice as to whether or not have kids. As a woman, I want to have kids one day. And so I think that's a very normal feeling among women to want to have kids. But I do think it's weird when we're forcing women to carry babies, especially in the case of rape or incest. These are stances that J.D. Vance has. He supported a six-week abortion ban in his home state. He identified as 100% pro-life. And I think that that just comes off as weird and it's unpopular in the United States. And the polling shows that that's an unpopular stance. And so I think a lot of women are going to be turned off for J.D. Vance. And he's going to be a liability for the Republican Party. Yeah, I know that J.D. Vance so far has supported Trump's idea of leaving abortion to the states, which is obviously different than his personal opinion on the issue, um, which is a pretty moderate position to allow states to decide. That gets the issue closer to the voters. It's also something that's supported by the majority of Americans, as is a 15-week ban on abortion. So you could say he's probably more pro-life than the average American, but based on what the Trump administration, or rather the Trump campaign has said they want to do, they're pretty in line with the American electorate. Um, the Kamala campaign has also been putting out all of these old quotes from J.D. Vance, claiming they're leaks that are supposed to be damaging to him, when they're really just things he said publicly on podcasts or on Fox News or what have you, where he talks about the ethical ramifications of basically women traveling to states that uh, don't ban abortions in order to get an abortion out of state and basically what that looks like. Um, it's been mischaracterized as him calling for a federal ban on women go going to a different state in order to get an abortion, which if you listen to the full thing is not what he said. There's also been a lot of consternation about him talking about childless cat ladies, which I mean, sorry, I kind of agree with him on this. I do think that allowing our national policy to be run by childless cat ladies is not the best idea. I think it's a good idea to probably have some people who have uh, their eyes set on the future of the country for their children and grandchildren to have a stake in what we're doing and making sure that our policy works well for families as well. Families are the building block of society, particularly American society. And again, I just I don't think it's weird at all to to say that that is the case. I don't know. As a woman, I never go to a gynecologist who is a man. I kind of feel the same way about any man making policies about women's bodies, about our uterus, about having babies. So I, I actually would take a childless cat lady as long as it's a lady over someone like J.D. Vance or Donald Trump making policies. And what scares me personally about the prospect of a Trump presidency is he was given a chance on that debate stage to say, you know, no, I wouldn't sign a six week ban if it graced my desk. He didn't respond to Joe Biden's point when Joe Biden said, 
I would not sign a six week total abortion ban if it graced my desk, but he would. And Donald Trump never corrected and said yes or no on that. And so that really scares me and I'm sure it scares a lot of women. Well, he did criticize Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for signing a six week ban. So I'd imagine that is pretty clear on where he stands on that issue. But I know we're gonna continue to follow both of the candidates' uh, views on abortion, particularly as Kamala Harris is now the presumptive nominee. We'll be back with more Rising after this.